to this webinar on COVID-19 and children deprived of their liberty. My name is Audrey Bollier. I am the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection and I'm very pleased to welcome today a diverse panel of experts who will talk with you about children deprived of their liberty during the COVID-19 response. The Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action is an interagency network of professionals working on child protection in emergencies. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19, we have developed a technical note to respond to major child protection concerns available in 18 languages. And based on the feedback from practitioners, we have as well developed several additional annexes and technical notes. So today we are very pleased to present the newest released technical note on COVID-19 and children deprived of their liberty, which was done together by the Alliance for Child Protection and UNICEF. During this webinar, we will have the pleasure to listen to a presentation on children deprived of their liberty and the international normative framework presented by Professor Anne Skelton. And then we will go a little bit deeper into the technical note itself, thanks to the presentation by Vijaya Ratnam. But before starting, I would like to invite the panelists to be able to present themselves. I'm going to start with Professor Anne Skelton. Good day, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Anne Skelton. I'm a professor of law at the University of Pretoria, specializing in child law, and I'm also a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, ben Lewis, I'm a human rights officer at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCHR, specializing on migration and human rights. Hello everyone, I'm Bridget Kennedy Feaster from UNICEF. I'm a senior child protection specialist working on children and armed conflict in particular. Hi everyone, my name is Holly Hobart. I'm Senior Program Director at the International Legal Foundation. We provide criminal legal services uh, for the indigent accused and help build effective, sustainable legal aid systems in post-conflict and transitional countries. Happy to be here with you all. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Marta Hill. I uh, work uh, for Terre Raison, Lausanne Foundation. I'm the Middle East and North Africa Regional Coordinator of the Access to Justice program. Um, our program really focuses on, on four pillars, dignity and detention, alternative measures and diversion, prevention and reintegration, we will talk a little bit about that, and also synergies of customized justice systems and formal systems. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My name is Vijay Ratnam Raman, and I work for UNICEF as a child protection specialist and the Access to Justice Global Focal Point. Lovely to meet you all and love it to have you on board. Before we jump into the core of the discussion, just a few technical issues. If you have any questions, dear attendees, you have a Q&A chat box where you can leave your questions and we will look at them after the presentation by the professor Anne Skelton and then Vijaya Ratman. We will be able to have a Q&A session together. Time has come to move forward and I would welcome professor Anne Skelton to talk a little bit more about the international normative framework and children deprived of their liberty. Over to you. Greetings to everyone, and I hope you're all well and safe wherever you are. At any given time, there are always hundreds and thousands of children deprived of their liberty all over the world. And this is a perennial concern, of course, but right now it is in fact cause for much deeper concern because in some countries we are actually witnessing a serious crisis as far as these children are concerned. And I say witnessing, and that might be in countries where at least we know what is happening. Indeed, in many countries, we don't even know what is happening to children deprived of their liberty because by their very nature, they're children who are not visible. They're children who the public don't think often about. Sadly, they're often the children who the government thinks about last as well. And so we are currently seeing that this requires a call to action. It means that everyone must be advocating for measures to be taken for these children and that government must act now to introduce a range of measures to deal with the situation. In international law, we have a range of normative frameworks ranging from treaties to general comments that are relevant here. 
And I think obviously the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention Against Torture are all very relevant, as well as the ICCPR, which give us um, the kind of bedrock on which we work and from where we take our standards. In addition to that, we also have the guidance of the treaty body's general comments. And here I would draw particular attention to general comment number 24 um, on children and child justice system, and also on uh, general comments 22 and 23, which were jointly done with the Committee on uh, Migrant Workers, and their number is um, three and four. Those together already create a very good basis from which to work. And if countries simply did most of the things that are advised in those documents, it would be a great start. But in the last few weeks, we've also seen a plethora of advice emerging from the various treaty bodies, as well as from international agencies, um, nations agencies, World Health Organization, and many prominent civil society actors have also been giving advice. So much so, in fact, that it is becoming a little confusing to know where to look and how to absorb and process all of the advice that is being given. And that, I think, is the tremendous usefulness of the technical report that we are going to be looking at. The, the technical note issued by the interagency panel brings together a lot of that normative advice, including the bedrock documents, as well as the current information that is of great value to those of us advocating in our own country. So I think this is timely and a great opportunity to start unpacking what that guidance means in the real context in which you work. Now, of course, from an international human rights point of view, we accept that in crisis situations like the one we are facing now, where states of disaster and states of emergency have been declared by so many governments in the world, there will be a limitation of certain human rights. However, it's very important to remember that at all times, these limitations must be reasonable, they must be proportionate to the need, they must be time bound, and they should not create further inequality for those who are the hard hit by this crisis, who are, of course, also the people who are always the most hard hit by poverty, and by other factors in society. And so I think it's really important for us to remain vigilant during this time, that whilst many of us understand that governments have to take action, have to make tough decisions, and we're probably, in many of us, we're, we're appreciating the great stress that government is working under at the moment, we have to remain vigilant about the protection of the rights of all citizens, and particularly those who are vulnerable and those who are in very difficult circumstances such as children deprived of their liberty. We cannot rest and we cannot allow too many infringements of rights to be taking place. And it's important, I think, whilst we rely very heavily on public health officials to guide the way at this time, we must at the same time bring to the table human rights and children's rights arguments to make sure the correct balance is maintained. One of the learnings that came out of the global study was the fact that many countries do not have enough information about the children deprived of their liberty in their own countries. So this becomes a serious problem that countries are now facing in order to plan effectively and to carry out actions that they need to take. Take, for example, some advice given by the technical note, which is that if prioritizing, one could start with children who are charged with less serious crimes. But do states know which children in their detention facilities are charged with which crimes? Do they know how many children there are at all if we're talking about transferring children or sending children home, even if we're just talking about ensuring that there is enough food and enough cleaning materials and enough staff in facilities, do states know exactly what they're dealing with? Now, for those of you who work in developed country situations, these problems may not be as acute. 
but for those of us working in developing countries, these are all very major considerations. And so I also think it's important for us to keep context in our discussions. So it does depend on where you are and what you can work with, how much you can do. So you should remember that if your government is one that is well resourced and does know all about its populations of persons in detention, then you can push them very far in terms of what you can ask. If you are working in resource constrained countries where it's very difficult, there's a lack of information, particularly in the public domain, then it requires perhaps a different response and an acute prioritization to be able to do the best that we can for as many children as soon as possible. Context is also important in making decisions because I'll just talk a little about South Africa where I'm living. One of the biggest problems that we're facing right now is poverty and hunger. We literally have millions of families who do not know where their next meals are going to be coming from to feed their children. And in circumstances like these, simply moving children back home has to be thought through quite carefully as families are already very stretched. But at the same time, it's hard to justify the idea that a child who would otherwise be able to go home shouldn't go home due to poverty. So there we have to be asking states to put in special support measures and provide extra food or other types of support to those families. I'm simply giving this as an example, and I'm sure you'll be able to give us many examples, and we hope to hear about the work that's happening on the ground from all of you during this webinar. The other thing that I think we should keep in mind is that the very measures taken to manage the disease, the spread of the disease, is in many instances causing problems. So whether those problems are because the courts are shut and not happening, or because lawyers can't consult with their clients, or because parents can't travel to care facilities where their children might be being held, all of these things are causing problems. And on top of that, we also have often strict lockdown measures, which are being strictly enforced, and that is leading to arrests and further detentions, unless we have managed to convince governments that there must be no arrests and detentions, particularly of children, in relation to the COVID-19 special regulation. Finally, one of the other challenges we're facing is that it's a moving target. And measures that were taken at the beginning of a two-week lockdown that may have seemed reasonable at the time do not seem reasonable when those two weeks become three weeks or four weeks or six weeks. And so actually we're going to have to keep working on this in an iterative process to make sure that we keep our finger on the pulse of what is happening on the ground and change our strategies and our measures to be able to deal with this crisis as it unfolds. I will end there with this brief introductory presentation and we'll move on now to hearing more about the technical note itself. Thank you so much, Professor Skelton, for putting together the wider international normative framework to help us to understand exactly what are the challenges for these children during the COVID-19. And I'm going to hand it over to Vijaya Ratnam uh, for a more in-depth introduction of the technical note. Thanks so much, Audrey. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give a brief outline of the technical note, noting that most of you would have read it by now. So with the rush of lockdown measures spreading across the globe, UNICEF became concerned quite early on about the situation of children deprived of their liberty experience from previous infectious disease outbreaks had suggested that new child protection risks were likely to emerge from the direct effects of COVID-19, as well as from measures to prevent and control its spread. Moreover, existing child protection risks were likely to be exacerbated. Children deprived of their liberty were particularly at risk due to their often compromised physical psychosocial and mental health issues, being detained in crowded or unhygienic conditions, and their prevailing vulnerability to abuse and neglect. Noting that the concerns about COVID-19 and children deprived of their liberty went beyond humanitarian context. In fact, as we know, the majority of countries were not in a humanitarian situation, UNICEF convened an interagency task force with the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. 
And this task force drew on international and national NGOs, academia, as well as UN agencies. And you can see those agencies in the list of endorsements in the note. As Professor Skelton mentioned, at the time there was a steady stream of information as the WHO, OHCHR, and CSOs released guidance about prisons and detention. However, what we were seeing was that they did not necessarily have the space to accommodate the unique international norms and standards and the unique dimensions regarding children deprived of their liberty. So this all resulted in an agreement amongst the interagency task force on the need for specialized guidance on children. All members of this interagency task force were deeply involved in fast and furious reviews, inputs, amendments, and the eventual finalization with a court writing team made up from the Office of the SRSG on Violence Against Children, Terre des Hommes, and UNICEF. All in, it was about a two week process from the 24th of March to the 31st of March, where UNICEF finalized an internal version of the note. And then 8th of April, where the interagency version was endorsed and released online. And just to note that this particular note is considered an annex to a broader technical note on the protection of children during the COVID-19 pandemic, which was again led by UNICEF in partnership with the Alliance and which came out first. Onto the technical note. The technical note at its heart calls on states in their response to the pandemic to respect, protect and fulfill the rights of every child who, are de who is deprived of her or his liberty. This involves providing care and protection from harm, including by taking concrete steps to reduce overcrowding in all facilities in which children are in detained and ensure their safe placement in non-custodial family or community-based settings. It also means that all decisions and actions concerning the child must be guided by the principle of the best interests of the child and the child's rights to life, survival and development and to be heard. The note aims to provide detaining authorities, so both state and non-state, with key information and steps to respond. Firstly, by instituting a moratorium on new children entering detention facilities, releasing all children who can be safely released, and protecting the health and well being of any children who must remain in detention. You will notice that when the note, while the note is entitled Children Deprived of Their Liberty, it primarily draws attention to children in the juvenile justice system, including those in pretrial custody children held in immigration detention or on other administrative grounds, children detained in relation to armed conflict or national security, and children living with their parents in detention. Which children should be released was a major discussion amongst the task force members. And as you will see, the note goes into greater detail in respect of these broad situations I've just mentioned. I won't read out those details as you all have the note. The interagency task force recognized that we would be unable to cover all children in one note due to time and space limitations. We also knew that a separate note on alternative care was underway and there would likely be other notes. We also agreed that the other situations of deprivation of liberty could be incorporated as the note evolved. And finally, we recognize that this is ultimately a decision to be made by states. So the recommendation was drafted broadly to prioritize the release of children deprived of their liberty where it is safe to do so and in consideration of the best interests of the child. In making that decision, authorities were reminded to account for the increased risk of illness in detention and the views of the child. We also provided a coverall that you'll see 
any other child for whom it has been determined it is feasible and safe to be released. The technical note is basically organized into three broad sections. Firstly, recommendations on the use of deprivation of liberty and emergency measures during the pandemic. And this covers international human rights laws and standards as they apply to children in detention and safeguards against discrimination. The second section looks at recommendations for the release, use of alternative measures, and no new entries of children into detention during the pandemic, covering groups of children that should be prioritized for release, the prevention of new admissions, maintaining the health and well-being of children in detention, and safeguarding children from violence, abuse, and exploitation. Finally, it also includes steps that justice actors can take to prevent deprivation of liberty and ensure the release of children. And as you see, it covers police, corrections, immigration, border guards, and other law enforcement officials, prosecutors, defense and legal aid lawyers, the courts, and law and policy makers. Again, it is not an exhaustive list, but it is focused on key actors as a first step. The note has been endorsed by 20 agencies, plus UNICEF and all members of the Alliance, which is 20 plus core members. And they are listed in the note and the icons on your screen. The note is indeed a living document and we will be taking comments and updating as we go and welcoming new endorsements. So please share widely and refer any request for endorsement to us. Translations are available now in Arabic, French, Spanish, Russian, Turkish, and Bahasa Indonesia. As time was of the essence for the translations, we have released them and seek your support to review and quality check them. We will place a link on the Alliance website to a document for you to enter your suggested corrections and we'll update those translations on a regular basis. So with that, I will end my presentation here and thank you all very much. Great, thank you so much, both of you for your presentation and really drawing quite well the situation of the children deprived of liberty and the impact of the COVID-19 that has on them. We will now move to some Q&A sessions. We have previously to this webinar ask to receive some question and we did receive some so we will start by addressing them if you do have some question there is a chat box named q and a where you can park your question and if the time allows we will be able to answer those questions so i'm going to start with the first question um, and this one, I think I would appreciate if Professor Skelton and Holly Hobart uh, could provide some answers and, and a guidance about that. A halted juvenile justice system might hinder not only efforts to release children, but also their diversion and access to alternatives to detention, especially if children are still being arrested or detained. This can lead to backlogs, children still ending up in detention and other violations of children's rights. What can be done with justice actor and governments to ensure that justice system can continue to function as much as possible, especially for these specific cases? So, you know, I think the main message here that I wanted to convey and that I think we should be advocating for is that the courts cannot shut down completely, right? They have to stay operational, at least in part, to keep conducting essential hearings, and particularly those around detention and release. When you're looking at detention issues, there are a number of fundamental rights that come into play, including the right to life, the right to liberty, where there's limited access to detention facilities, particularly with children. This is also the opportunity and opportunity to be able to make sure that your clients, these children are not being, are not being abused or tortured in, in detention, um, forced into, into any situations or forced into making any kind of statements. Also, obviously around release, there's got to be an opportunity to be heard on these issues, right? So 
whether it's an emergency application for release under COVID-19, um, or if it's just a general bail, uh, bail or bond argument, um, there may be uh, sort of non-alternative or non-incarcerative, non-custodial uh, dispositions that are possible, but but there has to be the mechanism um, in the court for this to happen. Um, and so, you know, there are examples of how this this conflict is is um, occurring. Um, for example, in Nepal, what we're seeing is a, a pretty uh, progressive um, stance from the attorney general's office to actually um, allow for release of, of children as long as the parents come to court and uh, make an application. But if the courts are closed or <clears throat> alternatively, if there's stay at home orders and parents can't get to court, um, you know, the children are not able to be released. Likewise, if, if lawyers are not able to get to court under stay-at-home orders or, or court closures, uh, there's also going to be a problem in implementation and, and the actual effectuation of getting children out of detention, despite the, the best laid plans. Um, I think I'd make one more point about sort of a, a best practice or a possible solution here in, in both Palestine and I think, you know, in our experience here in the United States, what we've seen is where, the, where there can be a cooperation amongst justice sector actors. So in particular, lawyers and prosecutors, right, coming together to agree on the most vulnerable people that need to be released um, in, this, uh, in this crisis. So obviously including children who are currently being detained. Where the agreement and cooperation happens, the releases are able to be pushed through much faster. And so there's a level of, of strategy and strategizing, I think, that can also be um, effective. Thank you for those inputs, Holly. Anne, would you like to add something? Yes, I think, I mean, the question is asking if things you know, if the system shuts down, then there'll be a lot of delays for all children. But I think what one has to do in, in trying to talk to, to governments and, and convince them of the right strategy is to take a prioritization approach. And in that context, it's quite likely that trials, for example, will be postponed. But as long as the child is not in custody, that's possibly not so much of a problem. I know it's, you know it's difficult for people to carry on living a normal life when they're waiting for that court case and so on. But in the current circumstances, the most important thing would be to get that child out of custody to wait for trials. And I think it's very important to keep courts open for all consideration of, of uh, awaiting trial release um, and also to process any diversion orders. There may be some possibilities of diversions that could be done online. I would think now in countries where more people are uh, have to, the technology to do that. So maybe diversion doesn't have to stop. Perhaps it just needs to take a different form. But, you know, again, one doesn't want to suggest anything that introduces inequality where some children would be able to do it and others wouldn't be able to do it. So one has to keep that in mind all the time. Great. Thank you, ladies, for your inputs on, on this question. And I will move to the second question and I will potentially seek uh, answers from Marta and Anne again. Um, in countries where lockdown and other measures are in effect, what can be done with government and civil society organization to support social workers to do their jobs uh, so that release and reunification can be done in a safe manner and so that follow-up can take place? Marta? Yeah, thank you, Audrey, and thanks for the question. I'm going to share some, some quick points on the role of social workers, especially on, on this safe reintegration that we're talking about, not only for children that has been released, but also for those that has been kept in detention. And then I will put you some examples because I think it's the best way to also look at, at practices that are, that are happening. So 
thanks for the question. I think the role of social workers or case workers, it's a little bit overlooked. Generally speaking, when we talk about children in conflict with the law, including in this emergency, and indeed, we are seeing in this COVID-19 pandemic that they are really the, the, central, the central staff, I would say, because they really accompany the child, even if from distant services, but they are also convening and informing other parties, like could be lawyers, uh, prosecutors, or even judges when they are available. But also they make sure that child and family are participating in the amended or adapted plan that they are doing with them. Another point that I would really like to raise very quickly is also that as they are frontliners, safety and, and well-being for them is, is also a little bit overlooked. So we, we need to think of, of, of ways to improve that because in many countries, even when lockdown is in force or other measures are in effect, indeed they are also assisting high risk cases. So um, some examples that I would like to, to put in place to respond better to the question. We'll um, share the examples in Mali, in Palestine and in Jordan, uh, how we are seeing and how we are coordinating with, uh, with governments and with civil society organizations to support them in order to, to have the, the safe reintegration plan. So what, what basically is being used is a case management system, but adapted. So I also take note of, of the comments of Anne before. There is a prioritization and there is a risk attribution that is, doing, that is being done quite quickly with this reintegration approach. And at the beginning, we saw that children were released in these three countries, and then there was not very clear pathway on how this family situation was assessed or even the, the child plan, how, how to amend that and what are the resources available. But indeed, in these three countries, and I would refer, for example, to Mali, a quick committee has been put in place, but has been convened by social workers in which adapted plans have, have been uh, done with the child and with the families, and the social worker has been convening that. Same in Jordan, at the beginning they released a lot of children, but with not having the safeguards, and now it's really the social worker who is, I mean, really, I mean, going with these type of services. Uh, some of them are distant services, but indeed we are seeing that even though when it's not the same as face-to-face -face support, this social worker is really the one that is, that is um, following up of, on the plans, on the distant services that the child is having, but also the family. And I just want to say the last point, like we look at social workers as convening other professionals that can provide service, but indeed we are seeing that they are um, accompanying psychosocially the, the child and the family directly. So uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a matter of adapting case management process but it's also to really put the attention on the social worker to convene information. I, I think they would also have a great role on uh, inputting when the judicial review of the cases are going to be uh, in the books. Great. Thank you, Marta. Anne? Yes, I think um, social workers and probation officers, uh, child and youth care workers and uh, youth workers are very important at this time, and yet quite often governments might overlook them when deciding which categories of workers are essential services and which categories of workers should be given permits to travel, for example, to, to undertake their work. So those are areas where one can make recommendations to government. Um, I've noticed here as well that in bringing children to court in order to have them released, it was necessary to do a lot of coordination with families and really the ideal people to do that are social workers, to contact the family first to determine whether they're in a position to take the child, to tell them when the child will be appearing in court. The, the care centre might be 100 kilometres, 200 kilometres away from where the family lives. And so one needs, there, there are a lot of logistics that, that go into all of this. So you need somebody who feels it's their job to liaise with the family. And I'm afraid that very often police and prosecutors do not consider it to be their job to do that. So these are crucial workers and where in states where that is not being recognized, we must be pushing government to make sure that all of those people are freed up and able to do their work. And of course, if they're in government employed, must be paid for their services as well. Thank you, ladies, for your answers to this question. We're going to move to the next one, and I will ask Ben, Bridget, and potentially Holly to provide us with some answer. What can be done to push for the release of certain groups of children in detention that governments refuse to release, such as children in immigration detention, children accused or convicted of association with an armed group, children detained on national security grounds, children being de facto detained by non-state armed groups. Bridget, would you like to start? Sure. 
Thanks a lot, and uh, thank you for the question. So definitely this question is a tough question. I think we all acknowledge that there are different concerns for different populations of children. And if you look at the technical note, we've tried to really carve out and identify, and I, and I think as Anne said, prioritize among, among um, the, the, the large number of, of children that are held, how, how um, children can be, or um, how it can be assessed, how, how children could be prioritized. Among them are children associated with armed groups, and we have included that as a category because association itself is actually a violation of child rights. The recruitment and use of children in armed conflict is a human rights violation. And so, as a first instance, children shouldn't be detained for what amounts to a violation of their rights. And so we, we do continue to advocate for those children to be released, um, particularly if the, the evidence that has been either that they're accused of or convicted of was solely based on association. So there isn't evidence of some other kind of crime. And there are a lot of children who around the world have been swept up through um, by security forces um, merely because of their family um, members or other kind of generalized concerns about the armed group. So we do think that there is an avenue and there should remain an avenue as a key child rights issue. And because of the ever growing and large numbers of children in those detentions and the conditions in which they find themselves. Uh, similarly, detentions based on national security grounds, it's generally related to association with an armed group. So it's very much related to that. And just to note as well, um, generally speaking, um, when it comes to armed conflict and children detained um, under these rubrics, um, we generally have advocated for, and, and in fact, it's under Paris principles and under international law, children should be handed over to child protection authorities rather than military detention, rather than detention by for, for, the, for association. So it's consistent with all of our advocacy around children affected by armed conflict to have those children be actually dealt with by a child protection system rather than a more criminal justice and, and national security based frameworks. And finally, I just wanted to add with respect to children who are detained by non state armed groups, you'll see in the technical note that a lot of it is addressed to states. But actually, this all of this is applicable to any kind of detaining authority, whether they are a state detaining authority or other authority, whether there is a legal framework that, that uh, applies, whether it's arbitrary detention, what is being called for here is the release of children who are being deprived of their liberty and in this context by any detaining authority. Just to say as well, I think all of you have heard the Secretary General and the Executive Director of UNICEF calling for a global ceasefire and supporting that notion. It would be one of the good outcomes from the COVID-19 terrible situation that we're facing if more parties laid down their arms and children were released. And so Again, it's kind of tanned. Our call for release of children from detention is also sort of in parallel aligned with a global ceasefire. And then just to say as well, we want people to look and authorities to look at the best interest of the child. I think that was mentioned in the decision making. So even where it seems that authorities would not want to release particular groups of children, that really what needs to be guiding them is the principle of what's in the best interest of, of, the, of these children. And so uh, continuing to advocate along those lines, which is a very familiar concept to most authorities. Um, let's go back to those kind of core issues, those core rights, um, core principles, guiding principles, um, anti-discrimination, et cetera. Um, so try to use all of those tools that we have with respect to these, these particular groups. Over to you, Ben. Thanks very much, Bridget. And actually, a good to, to follow on that because I think I'll echo a lot of those same points. I'll speak specifically to the, the context of the detention of children on the basis of their or their parents migration status. I mean, a couple of things and then I have a few ideas for what can be done to push for release. First is in this context, I think building on what Bridget said, it's not just looking at release options, but also looking at preventive options in the first instance. There's very clear international normative guidance now that the immigration detention of children is a child rights violation. It's never in their best interests. And Professor Skelton had earlier referenced the two joint general comments of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Committee on Migrant Workers that say unequivocally that this kind of detention is never in the best interest of the child and should be expeditiously ceased, completely ceased. 
Um, so I think we need to continue looking to the norm-based guidance for direction and really advocating along those lines for a, a full cessation of this kind of, of detention. Um, but in addition to um, into these sort of preventive measures, by not arresting, not detaining children in the first instance, there is quite a bit that can be done um, in terms of release. And I think we'll talk a bit later on about alternatives to detention and what some of those alternative models are. I wanted to highlight a few ideas. One is, I think we have to build an advocacy strategy around non-detention that's closely linked to combating racism and xenophobia and other related intolerance, particularly in the context of immigration detention and COVID-19. Specifically for non-nationals or immigrants, there's been a historical link between non-nationals or immigration as sort of vectors of disease carrying. And this has been roundly debunked by evidence. There was a, a really important study done by the, and published by the Lancet Journal of International Medicine in 2018 that showed that there's no statistical correlation whatsoever to immigration by non-natives or non-nationals and infectious disease spread. In fact, non-nationals, asylum seekers, other migrants are more likely to, to catch infectious diseases in the countries where they're residing in places like detention than they are to bring it across the border, for example. And that there are actually stronger health outcomes related to societies that are more open to migration. So I think we need to have an advocacy strategy and a way of talking about the issue that delinks fear of infectious disease spread from things like migration, um, which is not a threat per se to one's health or one's national security, uh, etc. Secondly, I was going to say that there are a lot of movements already in the works that, that folks on this call might be aware of, but in case you're not aware of, I, I wanted to bring them to your attention. There's a, already a global uh, um, strategy um, that the UNHCR has launched called Beyond Detention that advocates for not detaining children in the context of asylum seeking. There's a, um, there's a global campaign called the Global Campaign to End the Immigration Detention of Children that has hundreds of supporters, in, including my office, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNICEF, and others. And I think people could uh, look at those campaigns and, and join them as a way of furthering the advocacy efforts to, to release children. And then there's quite a bit being done at the field level to advocate for release into alternative measures. And just to, to point to a couple that I'm aware of, and I'm sure folks on the line are aware of, of many, many more, um, the International Detention Coalition has uh, done numerous rounds of research highlighting what are the available alternatives to detention in the context of, of migration. The International Social Service has developed guidance on cross-border case management and, and social work models for, for non-detention. SOS Children's Villages and Save the Children and others are operating shelters. There are a number of fantastic shelters at the national level specifically for immigrant children. So I think that there's quite a lot that can be done. And maybe just the last word, there are some specific examples of places that this is going well and places where maybe it's not going so well. And I thought one particularly prescient example was if you look at the United States versus Portugal, Portugal rather famously in the, in the last several weeks has essentially extended uh, residency rights to all undocumented immigrants on their territory, precisely as a way to avoid uh, people falling into a regular status or to uh, avoid them not accessing health care or to avoid them being detained based on uh, the transgression of immigration laws. The United States, on the other hand, while it has released I think around 700 out of the roughly 400,000, or pardon me, 40,000 uh, immigrant detainees in, in ICE custody currently, continues to do, conduct ICE raids and continues, continues to conduct deportations. And so we know that this kind of behavior is increasing the number of children that are being detained every day. So we have called as OHCHR for a moratorium on deportations, a moratorium on arrests and detentions on the basis of immigration status. And that's consistent with our calls generally to end all immigration detention of children. And in fact, our calls going back 10 years along with the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention and others for a cessation or a gradual reduction of, of immigration detention generally. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ben. Holit, would you like to add anything to this question? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. I, I did just want to note one more very practical 
option in trying to respond to the government not releasing certain certain groups of children is through litigation, right? So lawyers can actually go to the court and argue that the government is unlawfully keeping these children in detention. And that is exactly what the function of of the courts is, is meant to be, right? They have not only the authority to release these children who are being detained who shouldn't be, but also the responsibility to release them in order to uphold and protect their rights to ensure proper enforcement of the laws. And there are lawyers all over the world filing these kinds of extraordinary applications, both on individual cases, but also potentially seeking the, the release en masse of groups of children um, and groups of detainees to try to get more people released, you know, at once. And, you know, and, and I'm happy uh, to talk to any of the participants sort of one-on-one -on -one afterwards about how to do that. But there are certainly a number of legal arguments um, that can be made. Great. Thank you for that, Holly. I'm going to move to, to the next question and I will ask Bridget and Holly to provide some answers, please. Isn't there a risk that communities will reject the children who have been released and consider them dangerous, especially due to the circumstances of their release? For example, some children convicted and sentenced for a less serious crime may be more likely to be pardoned and released compared to those who haven't yet been convicted but who may be suspected of a more serious offense. Bridget or Oli, who would like to start? Oli, please. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think even before the COVID-19 crisis, it's already been very important to try to educate communities and communicate on outreach about the reality of this situation for children in detention pretrial. As was mentioned sort of in the question, all of these children being detained pretrial, they are they have not been convicted of any crime, right? They are not convicted criminals. They are all presumed innocent, which is a, a fundamental human right. They, for the most part, have been charged with. The situation is actually that these children who really are at the top of the list, who should be released always, and particularly now in the COVID-19 crisis, actually are, there's more sort of logistical challenges to getting them released. And so, you know, through pardons with children who have already been convicted and sentenced, there's less of practical things that need to happen in order for those kids to be released. Unfortunately, what's happening is a bit of the, an ironic situation where sentenced and convicted children are actually more likely to be released during COVID-19 than, than children pre-trial. And so I think the real solution here is continued advocacy, continued litigation, right? This is why courts need to remain open so that lawyers can make these release applications on behalf of children. There may also be sort of possible non-diversion alternatives or mediation possibilities to, to actually try to implement now as well, all sort of pre-trial or pre-conviction. Really to get kids out of detention, right, to avoid the trauma, not only of prosecution, but also obviously of detention, and now particularly under COVID-19. So just to add, I think I want to go kind of go back to one of the emphases that Marta was talking about, which is the importance of social work and the importance of the connection. When we're talking about the stigma or issues related to acceptance of children into communities, a lot of that has to do with preparation of families and communities to receive them. And social workers are the key to that. And so I think the call the, from the general technical note on child protection, which really was talking about, you know, how to keep case management going, how to ensure that essential workers, social workers are considered essential in the midst of the pandemic so that they can continue to do that work is really important to keep emphasizing as advocacy point and understanding and emphasizing that social workers within justice systems are part and parcel of that and aftercare services are part and parcel of that. The other thing to think about, I, I think, is is across the world, we're at very diff different countries are at very different stages of the pandemic. Some of them are in a place where they could be doing preparation and could be doing that advocacy now and thinking about it now. So if you, as 
you know, some are under very strict lockdown already, or maybe moving in and out of restrictive, of different restrictions. And so thinking about what you can do for preparation to really talk about and get children connected to their families, talk with authorities about how they might actually effectuate some of this on a practical basis. Those conversations should start early, early, early in anticipation that there may be more serious restrictions going forward or as maybe country moves back out, that they are in that prepared to allow families and children to move. The other thing to think about is, you know, creating some ways to have people who are dealing with these issues actually get permission to travel and to move as essential people are having uh, families having permission to move to get their child and so to have those dialogues. So just thinking holistically and kind of in a problem solving approach may be useful. Great. Thank you, Brigitte. And I have seen that Anne, you raised your hand. Did you want to add anything? Yes, on the awaiting trial children issue, I, I think, I mean, what we're trying to do here in South Africa is to bring those children on a case and, and have them considered for release on a case by case basis. And that is really very uncontroversial. It's the most uncontroversial way to do it. But it often depends on your numbers. So we have less than 600 children that we're trying to charge with a range of crimes who are in custody at the moment. Those are spread out all over the country. So logistically, it's possible to bring that number of children to court. But of course, if your numbers are much larger than that, then it might be a good idea to approach either the government or who could pass a regulation of some sort or the courts or a court in a kind of strategic litigation basis to say, you know, all children charged with these kinds of offences should be released and to try and make it so that they can be released directly from the centres or the prisons where they are as long as an authorised person comes to collect them and take them home to stop this kind of the very circuitous, complicated route of having to go to court before you can be released back home. So those are just some of the things that we've been trying to think through those different options. And we've decided to go the case by case route because we think we can do that quite quickly, probably get all those children to court within a week. But, you know, if you've got bigger numbers, then you've got to think a little bit more creatively than that. Great. Thank you for this addition. Before we move to the next question, I wanted to reassure all the participants to this webinar that we are reading your question, we are collecting them, and hopefully we will be able to answer them or at least some of them. But we wanted to reassure you, we are reading you, we are taking notes of your questions. So thank you for that. The next question will be for Ben and Marta. Should assistance be provided to places of detention to improve condition of detention, for example, through the provision of hygiene material and training, even if this might risk government considering the place of detention as safe for the children and thus less likely to release them? This problem can be compounded in areas where detainees, including children, may rely on their family and charity for food. Ben, would you like to start? Sure, I was just looking at Marta to see if you wanted to go. Sure, I mean, I think in the immigration context, which again is my expertise and so what I'll speak to, I think the answer is it depends. And I think it depends primarily on whether or not the detention is arbitrary. I think it's, it's helpful to recall that the prohibition of torture or the prohibition of refoulement, the prohibition of arbitrary detention is absolute. And so we wouldn't talk about how to torture someone in a more humane way, or we wouldn't talk about how to return someone in breach of the principle of refoulement in a way that is more humane or more comfortable. And so we also wouldn't talk about how to detain someone arbitrarily in a way that is more humane. So in that sense, the, the call and what international law requires unequivocally is immediate release. And so in the context of child immigration detention, this detention is per se arbitrary. And so these children need to be released. And so we should not be advocating for building newer, shinier, nicer, friendlier, child-friendly detention centers for the purposes of immigration control. Now, I, I realize that analysis looks somewhat different in other contexts. The only caveat to that, I would say, and in fact, our office has been engaging quite extensively on this in the context of Libya, where that detention is fundamentally arbitrary, and we know that people are being uh, tortured and mistreated and going, uh, disappearing from detention centers in Libya, and yet life-saving assistance is still being provided by some non-governmental organizations and some UN entities. But I think there we've had a lot of difficult conversations about needing to ensure that life-saving interventions are very narrowly construed as interventions that save lives in the immediate sense, not three months, six months from now, 
Otherwise, we risk perpetuating a regime that is fundamentally illegal under international. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ben. Marta? Yeah, basically, well, just to add that, I would say it's not to make detention places safer for children, but it's just to acknowledge that children deprived of liberty, they have a right to, to have a dignified treatment. And in this emergency, well, I think we all know that according to, to child justice standards, detention should be the last measure, the measure of last resort for the shortest time possible, and, and always with this reintegration aim in mind, while the deprivation of liberty lasts. But I mean, and we should advocate for the release of children and we should assess the cases and we should put some minimum safeguards for the release of these children so not to do more harm. But yet, unfortunately, many children are going to be kept in detention. And I don't think, I don't think we, we should just let them. I think we should support that they have conditions that are, you know, providing basic services that are keeping in mind that they need to be treated in a dignified manner. And not really advocating for them to stay there, not really making safer places of detention for them to keep uh, the price of liberty as a better condition than to be out, but definitely yes to support those children while keeping the advocacy on, on, on the release and as I would say on a safe release. And uh, just to give you some examples at the beginning of this crisis, some of the countries in which we are working, uh, some authorities were exactly using this kind of argument. Right, in this COVID-19 emergency, children are going to be better in detention. And then I think like many governments have realized I mean, with a few weeks after that, this is not the case. They are not really well prepared to deal inside detention places with any sort of, of health measures or very few. But I, I think we should keep in mind that when we advocate with lawyers, with prosecutors, with judges, with social workers, and again, I, I would like to recall on their important role here, we should have in mind that the release of the children needs to be accompanied with minimum safeguards. And many, we, we have seen in this region many children just released and not having any sort of support or families not really, you know, not really, I mean, couldn't really go and, and, and look for them or support them and, and then has created you know, more issues where they have gone back to a detention place that is not really the safest place. So I would say, let's focus our advocacy on the safe release of children, but let's also consider that should be dignified treatment while in detention and we should be supporting them as well. Thank you both for your answers. I'll move to the next one for Anne and Ben. What can we do about other aspects and concrete examples related to rights of children in detention while under COVID-19 restrictions, such as ensuring that children can stay in contact with their parents, families, and continuing independent national and international monitoring of detention facilities? Anne, would you like to start? Yes, let me start with the issue of children having contact with their parents if they're still in. So one of the unfortunate things that we've seen is that in many countries, visits to all prisons and all secure care centers was stopped. This presumably to prevent the spread of disease, but it has a particularly harsh effect on child detainees when they can't see their, their families at all. And also, again, if you are in a country where technology is unlikely to be available both inside the center and in the community where the child lives, it's easier said than done to say, well, they can still keep contact by telephonic means or electronic means such as WhatsApp or Skype or anything like that. So I think it's important for us to be trying to push as far as possible that those things be set up now if they're not already in place. I also think it's important to say uh, we're, you know, we, we've moved from a three-week lockdown into a two-week lockdown, and I think it's time for government to start easing up on some of the conditions. We were under a very strict lockdown. You can't even go for a walk. You, know, you can't go anywhere except you can go and buy food, but that's the only, only thing that you can do. People can't, would not be allowed to go and visit someone. This would be a, a, a journey that you would not be permitted to make, particularly if you've got to travel to another town or city, which also there's a ban on doing. And so at the moment you would, I mean, we've even had court applications where two children were with their grandparents at the beginning of lockdown and their father had to actually bring a court application to, to dri drive to go and collect his own children from their grandparents and bring them home. That's how strict our lockdown has been. But I'm certainly advocating with government here that we should now start easing up and say, look, let's allow visits to happen but we're just going to have to manage it in a way that doesn't spread disease. So should, we've got to think out of the box a little bit. There's got to be obviously a space made available for those visits and there would need to be some monitoring of them and there would need to be uh, physical space keeping and so on. Um, but I think that it is time to start you know, 
easing up a little um, on these very strict measures. Just one other useful thing about then allowing parents to come and travel, whether it's to court or whether it's to coming to, to the centres, one way of doing it is to have an SMS sent to their phone that says, you know, the Department of Social Development has authorised me to collect my child from court or from the centre and so on. So using those kinds of handheld devices, even in poor countries, I certainly can say in Africa, and I'm sure this is true in many countries in Asia as well, that kind of technology people do have. And so we should think more about when governments are going to have to, you know, issue permits for people to travel around, using SMSs is a very practical way of doing it. Great. Thank you, Anne. Ben? Yeah, thanks. I was going to echo Anne's point about technology. I mean, I think p children have the rights, same rights within the detention center as they have outside of them in terms of rights to health and rights to education and rights to family life and so on and so forth. And there are many um, technological fixes to some of these things, at least in the, in the immediate future. But speaking a little bit about the, the question of monitoring and the ongoing monitoring of detention centers during COVID-19, I think we should be collectively advocating for viewing monitoring as an essential service in these times, first and foremost, I, I, along the line someone I think else said about, you know, access to lawyers and access to functioning court systems. I think monitoring is an essential aspect of detention and it should be ongoing even in times such as these. And now there might need to be special precautions taken as there are by detention staff in general, but the, that shouldn't mean that monitoring stops. And, and in that respect, I'm reminded of Something I heard from the former Special Rapporteur on, on Torture, Juan Mendez, who I think was stealing it from a former SR on Torture, but that places of detention are meant to keep people out, to keep people in, not to keep people out, pardon me. And oftentimes we end up seeing detention used as a means of keeping people out rather than um, keeping people in. So whether it's family members or especially monitors, I think we should all be advocating that they have continued access. And especially, I guess, in that, this respect, national human rights institutions, the national preventive mechanisms established under the optional protocol and the Convention Against Torture, the ICRC, our office, the Human Rights Office, which has a, a fundamental monitoring mandate, but other UN agencies that have monitoring mandates like UNHCR, these are critical, but also NGOs. I mean, I think NGOs often get the, the end of that, that straw sometimes, but NGOs play a critical monitoring function of detention as well. So I think keeping the monitoring mandate as widely understood as possible and viewing that as an essential service would be critical in this time. Great, thank you for the additional input. We are very cautious of the time. We still have two questions that were pre-asked to go through. So in case we don't have time enough to answer some of your questions, as I mentioned previously, we are collecting them and we will try our best to provide answer if they were not already addressed through this discussion today and we will upload the q a on the alliance web website so you will be able to get some answers if you haven't gotten them today thank you for your understanding and your patience on this point the next question will be for Marta and, and Bridget. Justice for Children actors often have experience in complex and remote emergency settings in which family have to be traced and children reunified and reintegrated. While COVID-19 is a global phenomenon, what can we learn from the work being done in this context with regards to tracing and relying on local communities to ensure that families are able to be found and children reunified and properly reintegrated in their families and communities, whilst often not being able to move or facing severe restrictions? Marta, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. So I would like to be quite uh, specific on the question. And I think what we are seeing is like the community, community focal points, uh, child protection community focal points are really, again, like, like social workers are really a central figure here. Of course, I mean, they need monitoring. Of course, child safeguarding needs to be uh, attended, yeah, looked. But in order to, you know, to trace families, to reunite families, we are seeing that the connection between the, the, the I mean, those children that are in the detention center or about to be released 
with the social worker and the social worker, because at the end it's a child protection act or a little bit outside the scope of the justice sphere, how this is connected with child protection community-based groups or focal points, it's, it's really a, a channel that we are using to, to trace families in order to, to take care of their other children that could be released. You will see like in a in, in few days, there's going to be a guidance precisely on how to work with community-based focal points, not only for children deprived of liberty or about to be released, but they are also taking into account this category. And I think this mobilization organization with community-based structures is really key. But I would say not only to trace and reunite, reintegrate children with their families, but it's also, for example, we are seeing cases where children that are being released on this emergency release are not having family support, and then they're out there, not, not, not really being taken care of by, by anyone. And then this is also very linked with alternative care and how the alternative care measures could be linked with community supports, especially when we know that, you know, there are really uh, severe restrictions happening. So that, that is really the channel that I would, that I would suggest to, to explore here. Definitely, as, as my colleagues, the other panelists were, were mentioning before, we are driving different contexts, and I think contexts that are a little bit more advanced or are at the you know, earliest stages on, on dealing the, the pandemic uh, can really invest on, on community-based support uh, structures in order to do that. So uh, I'll just add, I think this echoes a little bit of what Anne was saying in the very beginning about the need to have data and information about children. So one of the things I think that would be really helpful when advocating with authorities is for lists to be prepared, for contacts to be made, for that tracing to have already happened. In fact, it should already be in a, in a child's case file. That the family contact is a key right of the child in while in detention. And so establishing those family links, um, that's something that we do all the time in emergencies when it comes to, to tracing unaccompanied children, working with ICRC, they, they do their own work on restoration of family links. So they're also a key actor that could be very useful. But in terms of dealing directly with authorities, it's, it's about that process. So it's not only about going to court and, and getting the child released and that that legal process, it's the preparatory part, which is identifying the child, calling the parents, being in touch, getting that caseworker to be connected to both the authorities and the family, and making that a reality, a living reality for the family. And so, especially if you're in if you're in early stages, the collection and the the compiling of those that data. And, and doing the prioritization work is essential. And so I would suggest that that should, key tasks, you know, can be done by lawyers, can be done by social workers, can be done by probation officers, can be done by so many people within the system, but maybe coming up with a clear strategy about who should be doing that within the system, how it should work. It must be, it must be sort of assigned to a particular potential group of people to, to really start that process going forward. So it's a practice, it can become a practical reality as the, the, the whole uh, process moves forward. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Martha and Bridget. Being cautious of the time, we will have a final question and I will invite all of you to inputs and answers wherever you, you can. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the question is, it can be argued that a lot of the guidance in the technical note should be applied outside of the context of COVID-19 response. Uh, use of diversion and alternatives to detention, no immigration detention of children, flexible work arrangement, use of technology, etc. How can we ensure that after the pandemic has passed, we don't lose gains achieved? And I will start with Bridget. Is that okay for you? Sure. So, I mean, I think I think this is one of the key questions about what we're we're all kind of facing, which is we're at this really interesting nexus of the sort of emergency development nexus. How do we capitalize on new entry points that are created that we reinforce child rights across the board? Um, you know. It, it's it's actually the million dollar question, I think. I don't know that I have an answer, a specific answer, except to say that we should be really kind of continuing that advocacy. We actually, a part of this note is actually trying to advance an 
a, a greater opening in child justice work and using this as an entry point. So it may be an opportunity um, that we, you know, as much as it feels like this overwhelming uh, challenge, it's also a really great opportunity. And I think it's, a, it's an important question about how we can keep our, in our minds that long-term view so that it isn't just a one-off and maybe it's just integrating those thoughts. Um, I don't know that there's a specific silver bullet of a how we can keep this going, but keeping it in our minds front and center and talking to authorities. And it could also create some relationships that we can keep moving forward on after the fact, but I'll turn it over to others for their thoughts. Thanks. I may go with the order that appears on, the, on my screen. Holly, would you like to jump in? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think the opportunity that arises here is maybe one of creativity. The ILF, it, it's been our experience that it's always much, it's, it's easier to write the laws than to actually implement them. But there are a lot of underutilized or sort of non-utilized, whether they're new or just kind of dormant provisions in the law that could be, that could be really sort of used to our advantage during this kind of situation. So my hint here or sort of my suggestion and encouragement is to look for those provisions in the law around, you know, alternatives to incarceration, non-prosecution of cases. For example, in Afghanistan, they have a provision in the law that gives prosecutors the discretion to not prosecute low-level crimes, right, or not prosecute crimes that you know, based in the interests of justice. And, and those, that provision is not being used in, in Afghanistan at all, but we're, we're pushing now under these situations to try to, to reduce the number of, of new detainees and, and new prosecutions. You know, again, these new concepts around diversion, mediation, probation, those are all, you know, written in the law, but are written in the law in some places, but, but not being fully implemented, right? So this is the opportunity, I think, to really sort of argue, to interpret and interpret in a way that's, that's most protective of our clients' rights. And, and that will have a very lasting effect. Thank you, Holly. Marta? Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, also very shortly, I mean, I agree with, with my colleagues, but I just want to drop two, three ideas that I think exactly we should capitalize on, on the developments that we are seeing, even if very early right now. I mean, once we are in the era post-COVID-19, hopefully soon. So, for example, in, in, in some countries where we're starting to apply alternative to detention or diversion, we are seeing that, for example, Jordan is one example where they are very in these initial states. When this emergency happened and, and, and they need to put in place a release of children, I mean, they were also using some of the guidance to put in, in, in practice alternative to detention, but that indeed they are using that for the first time, even if it's a different completely context. I think there is an advocacy there to see, okay, I mean, there is challenge to, to really work on diversion and alternative to detention should be explored. And this interdisciplinary that they, they are having among the professionals, even while driving an emergency, should should keep going in, in once we are once we are out of the pandemic. That is one thing. I think we also need to really focus attention on preparedness and child safeguarding policies in detention places because I think few of them were really prepared. And when no one was, of course, aware of the um, scope of this pandemic, this is something that we should keep in mind and, and work together on that. I think, and obviously on, on the monitoring of, of this. Uh, policy implementation and preparedness plan in detention centers. And, and the last point that I would like to, to raise is like, we are seeing also the, the adaptation of case management systems. And I would say, when we talk about children in conflict with the law, those deprived of liberty or, or those that now are, are released on emergency, um, the majority of them were, were not part of the system, were absolutely outside any sort of national referral pathway or case management system. And we are seeing that some of the case management systems are really very quickly adapted to have them included even when they, when they are able to provide uh, less services. So I think this is another area of where, where we should yeah, strengthen the links with children in conflict with the law and, and some city uh, systems. Thank you. Great. Anne, and then Ben, for last few words, looking at the time, where we would like to hear your thoughts, please. Yes, I think it depends on how creative states get to be, because if they do manage to do things during this time afterwards, we can say, well, you did it then, you can do it, you can continue to do it. But I would also add, let's also try to capitalize on the fact that they can now see the problems in the system. So lack of case management, lack of statistics, lack of knowledge of their systems, we can now say, 
never again must this be allowed to happen because we may face more crises in the future, but that will also benefit the general system going forward. Thank you, Anne. And Ben? I'll try to uh, end on a similarly positive note, uh, maybe starting somewhere dark and going somewhere positive. In, in my context of immigration, you know, the use of immigration detention really became a global phenomenon after the uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11. And our response at that time was grounded in fear that led to an othering of immigrants that really led to this phenomenon that was very little practiced before 9-11 and is now very greatly practiced uh, in, in all parts of the world. So I think the, the takeaway from that is moving from a fear-based way of understanding or communicating or viewing this issue to a hope-based way of, of understanding and communicating about what we're going through. Seeing this as something that um, moves away from us versus them narratives to more of a, a, a greater community of us, a greater community of we. As Anne was saying, we know it works. We know we can do it. We can build systems based on child protection, based on public health that move away from harming people towards protecting all of us. And I think that is how we, we guard against really backtracking. Great. Thank you very much. Vijaya, would you like to come in and, and help us closing this session, please? Uh, thanks, Audrey. And I just wanted to take this moment to thank all the panelists for their inputs and also all the attendees to also uh, for their participation and all of their questions. As Audrey has mentioned, I've been monitoring them and we will collate them and provide uh, some written answers to them because we there's been some very fantastic questions and asking for some great examples, to, good examples to be shared from different countries. So we will document them all and upload the answers to the Alliance website alongside the technical note after this webinar. And also my great thanks to Audrey for so wonderfully hosting and moderating this webinar today. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. It has been a pleasure having this webinar with all of you. Thank you for your great answers and thank you for the attendees for your participation. We will provide more information over the website and it has been a pleasure spending this moment with you. You take care and stay safe and well. Thank you, everyone.